let's begin with a word of prayer, and uh, we will uh, dive in to our study of the book of Acts tonight because we have some really, really amazing things that, that God has for us here this evening. So let's, let's begin with prayer. Father, we, uh, we honor you. We bless your holy name. We, we thank you for your incredible goodness. We thank you that though you are God of the universe and so far beyond us, we thank you that you care for us and you are near to each and every one of us. We praise you for the way you've broken into our history and into our world. We thank you for our Lord Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, the hope of the nations and our Savior and our Lord and our Redeemer. May we tonight experience the fullness of your Holy Spirit as you speak to us through your word and direct those words to each of our hearts. Lord, may we encounter you this evening and may this be life-changing for each and every one of us. We pray it in the strong name of Jesus who has risen from the grave and who is returning soon. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to get started this evening and uh, pick up where we had left off last time, which, if you will recall, was at the end of Acts chapter 24. And uh, I, I'd like to just kind of refresh some memories by using a very old account. And this is uh, an account written by the Jewish historian Josephus, who lived in the latter part of the first century and who very conveniently just happened to write some things about the two governors that we were talking about last week and we'll be talking about this week, Felix and Festus. This is from uh, Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews. Uh, keep in mind, Josephus was a, uh, a Pharisee, uh, a former general in the Israeli army, and uh, was captured by the Romans, ended up encouraging other Jews to stop fighting against Rome, uh, was then basically commissioned to write a history of the Jewish people and of the Jewish war. And we have some fascinating things and fascinating insights from him. But this is what uh, Josephus writes. This is in uh, section 20 of his Antiquities. And uh, here's what he says. When Porcius Festus replaced Felix, and you'll recall last week we were talking about the Roman governor Felix, and uh, we mentioned the fact that he was recalled to Rome that his brother got him off the hook because he had been such a, uh, an ineffective and corrupt governor. And he is replaced by Festus, or Porcius Festus, as, as his uh, name is. It says, when Porcius Festus replaced Felix, the Jewish leaders accused Felix before Nero. And he would have been punished had not his brother Pallas interceded. Festus, meanwhile, had to contend with the Sicarii, Sicarii would be the, the, uh, the knife wielders, the, the zealots who carried these wicked blades hidden underneath their robes and made it a point to, uh, whenever possible, knife a Roman soldier in the back or, even more likely, knife someone among the, the Jewish people who was collaborating with the Romans. Uh, as we had mentioned last week, during Felix's reign, the, the, the government was in shambles and the, the culture was collapsing. They were on the verge of civil war. And uh, it's at that point now that Festus comes. And as Josephus tells us, Festus had to contend with the Sicarii who were plundering Judea, assorted imposters, and a newly erected western wall of the temple which blocked Roman surveillance as well as Agrippa's view. King Agrippa II, whom we're going to meet tonight, had the right to appoint high priests and enjoyed watching went on, what went on inside the temple as he dined in the Hasmonean palace on the west side of Jerusalem. The priests, therefore, built a high wall to block his view, which both he and Festus ordered demolished, but they appealed to Nero. Papea, Nero's wife, was sympathetic to the Jews and gained his permission to let the wall stand. Now, it, it gives us a little insight into what else was going on, uh, but it also highlights the fact that that's about all we know about Festus. And uh, what we have uh, regarding Festus in Josephus and in other Roman documents is extremely limited. Uh, 
What we have in the New Testament fills in a lot of the gaps. And, and tonight we're going to meet a, just a fascinating cast of characters. Even though we don't know a lot about Festus, we learn quite a bit about him here. And on top of that, we do know quite a bit about some of the other characters. And believe me, this is a soap opera. But it's a powerful soap opera. It is the real thing. And God is at work doing amazing things. And there is so much here. It's not only a fascinating insight into the world of the New Testament. It speaks directly into each one of our hearts. And, and the Lord has so much for us here. And so without further ado, we're going to dive in. Chapter 25, verse 1. Here is where Luke picks up the story where we had left off last time. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Now, please note, Festus is not wasting any time. What we saw with Felix is delay, delay, delay. Put things off. Uh, wait to get bribed. Uh, hold on till the last moment before you do anything. Festus comes in with a good deal of energy. He arrives in, in the city of Caesarea. And by the way, as he came into the city of Caesarea, we assume that he came by ship and uh, he would have sailed down the coast of the Mediterranean. The, the only way into the man-made harbor at Caesarea was from the north. And as a result, Festus would have most likely seen this Roman aqueduct, which is still standing today north of Caesarea, a massive construction that brought fresh water into the city. This is what provided the water the Apostle Paul drank while he was for two years under protective custody, house arrest here in, in Caesarea. Anyway, he would have passed right by this and uh, he gets into Caesarea. No sooner does he unpack and he is headed to Jerusalem. As Josephus tells us, and as we know from Roman sources, the, the, the country was descending into anarchy. And Festus moves quickly to try and change things. So Luke continues his account by saying, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. Now keep in mind, Paul has been held under house arrest for two years, but these, uh, these religious leaders are like bulldogs who are not going to let go. Maybe pit bull would be a better terminology. They're, they're not going to let go. And as soon as the new governor shows up in Jerusalem, the first thing they want to do is talk about Paul and arrange for his trial. Actually, as we'll see, arrange for his death. Because in the two intervening years, things have changed. You will remember that when Paul was first arrested, 40 zealots got together and vowed they would not eat or drink anything until they had killed Paul. They did it with the permission of the high priest. But listen now, it's changed. It's no longer an outside group getting the permission of the high priest with a little wink and a nod. It is the high priestly establishment working together. This is what Luke tells us. They requested Festus, verse 3, as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. You know, it, it's the, the priests themselves. And, and by the way, nothing has changed since the time of Jesus. This is probably around the year 59 or 60 AD. It's difficult to narrow it down exactly. But uh, we, we're talking now... Uh, more than 25, 27 years after the crucifixion of Jesus and after his resurrection, and the priestly establishment that had orchestrated his death is now still at it. They, want, they will do anything. They, basically, they maintain that the end justifies the means. Uh, the, they may be religious, but they are political animals. And so they're preparing to ambush and kill him along the way. Verse 4, Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me, and if the man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. After spending eight or ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. The next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought in before him. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. Then Paul made his defense. 
I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on those charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have, done no, I have not done any wrong to the Jews as you yourself know very well. And then he says this, If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. And this changes everything. Note, Paul has been languishing for two years now, waiting for something to be done about his case. And Festus arrives, and within a matter of a couple weeks or so, things start moving. And as the Jewish leaders gather around Paul, please note uh, verse 7. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. The Greek implies that they just, they crowded in around this guy and, you know, they, they are threatening him at every turn. And so it's at this point that he takes the right that he has as a Roman citizen and says, I appeal to Caesar. Uh, you know, to us today, that sounds really strange that a single individual could appear before the emperor of the entire, uh, the entire Roman world. But this was very much the right of, of individual Romans and is attested in Roman literature that has survived over the centuries. Paul is doing something that any citizen had the right to do if he's brought up on charges and feels he is not getting a fair shake. Uh, by the way, this, is, this was not uncommon even in early America. Uh, keep in mind, as, as late as the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln had many individuals meeting him at the White House, requesting favors from him. Everything from, can I have the uh, postmaster job in you know, West Podunk, to uh, my son was accused of desertion on the field of battle. He is scheduled to be executed. Would you please pardon him? And, and as we know from the historical record, Abraham Lincoln had a huge heart and pardoned many. Uh, Paul now appeals to the emperor, who is hardly what you would call an Abraham Lincoln character. He is none other than Nero Caesar, a, a man who started well, but who would become, in just a very short period of time, one of the first official Roman persecutors of the followers of Jesus. But Paul now appeals to the emperor, and that stops everything. Now, I, I, just a, a few comments here. First of all, I am guessing that Festus breathed a sigh of relief. Festus is obviously a very attentive, energetic, and uh, you know, capable individual. And he realizes this just took a load off of me. Because this guy's been sitting here in prison for two years. Felix didn't deal with it. Festus, as Paul says, Festus can tell there is no basis for these charges. In fact, Festus is faced with a real conundrum because the, the charges are political, but the evidence is theological. And that, let me tell you, is an ugly, ugly thing. <laughs> and so I'm guessing that Festus breathed a sigh of relief. Uh, he doesn't have to make the decision. Uh, Paul leaves the area and the emperor can handle it. And uh, Festus doesn't have to worry about assassination squads and the Sicarii and anything else like that. This, this resolves some things. I do feel it important at this point to mention something else. You will notice the way Luke uses the terminology, the Jews. And, and particularly for 21st century ears, the initial reaction when, when people see this is, well, is this anti-Semitic? Uh, first of all, I'd like to remind you of the fact that Paul was a Jew and quite proud of it. I, I would remind you that all of the 12 apostles of Jesus were Jewish. I would remind you Jesus was Jewish and, and, and still is, I might add. And, uh, and I'd remind you of something else. The term that is used in the New Testament, the Jews, 
eudaioi has a variety of meanings. Uh, let me just illustrate that with a word that everyone is familiar with, I, I believe, uh, among us here tonight. The word Yankee. Now, when you hear the word Yankee, what comes to mind? I would say it depends on when you live, where you live, and what interests your life. Because if you hear the word Yankee and you are living in colonial America, you immediately think of one of the popular songs of the day in the 1700s. Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. And, and you know, we hear that today and we say, what in the world is that all about? You know, macaroni, I mean, he's having pasta? No, uh, Yankee Doodle, in other words, oh, one of those hick colonists, thinks he is a dandy and as a result sticks a feather in his cap like is popular in London and believes that that makes him a cultured individual. Yeah, that's the way in 1700s a Yankee was somebody in the 13 colonies. If you're living in the 1850s and early 1860s and for many, many decades thereafter, and you live south of the Mason-Dixon line, a Yankee is one of those northerners, you know? one, one of those northerners who's trying to take away our rats. That's the way it was said. You know? If you are a uh, individual living in France in 1918, what is a Yankee? It's an American soldier because the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums, drum, drumming everywhere, okay? If, if, if you are a St. Louis Cardinal fan, like I am, a Yankee is the only ball, play, ball group or ball club that has won more World Series than the St. Louis Cardinals. You know, so Yankee has a variety of meanings at a variety of times. So does the word the New Testament uses for the Jews. First of all, it can mean the Judeans. That, that is one of the meanings. People who live in Judea, especially in the area around Jerusalem. And so in the Gospel of John, many times when it talks about the Jews, it's referring to the Judeans who, you know, live not in Galilee up in the north where people were extremely devout, but rather the Judeans living down in the south, many of whom had compromised to be with the Romans. It also has the meaning of any Jew. Jesus is a Jew, as we said, and uh, so were the earliest believers. In addition, it is used in the New Testament to refer to the Jewish elite, specifically to those closely connected with the temple, with the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin. And in that sense, it is used as, uh, to refer to Jewish leaders who oppose the message of Jesus. It's very important to keep that in mind as we read this because the, the term Jews will be used quite a bit in, in the section of scripture that we're going to be covering this evening. And it is not used in an anti-Semitic way. It is simply used to refer particularly to those Jewish leaders who not only sought to kill Jesus and did kill him, but now are hunting down believers in Jesus, Jewish believers in Jesus, not just Gentile believers in Jesus, and trying to kill them. So it's worth keeping that in mind and worth remembering that. Well, let's continue on then. As uh, we pick up here at uh, verse 12, after Festus had conferred with his council, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. And now things really begin to move and things also really begin to get fascinating and complicated. But also powerful stuff takes place. While we don't know a whole lot about Festus, we know quite a bit about Agrippa and Bernice. And in a nutshell, here are some of the things that we know. First of all, Agrippa II and Bernice were both 
children of King Agrippa I. We met King Agrippa I in Acts chapter 12. He was the, the Jewish king who arrested James, the brother of John, one of the 12, and killed him. <coughs> Pardon me. When he saw that was pleasing to much of the religious leadership, he threw the apostle Peter in prison, intending to kill him after the Passover. And you will recall, Peter was released from jail by an angel, the automatic door that appears for the first time in, in literature, and, and he is let out and finally realizes this is real, it's not a vision. And uh, Peter disappears at that point. And then we are told that later on, Agrippa I went to Caesarea, where he stood in the theater in the early morning hours as the sun was rising in the east. And we, we saw pictures of that theater last week and, and a number of weeks ago. He stands in the theater, the sun is rising, he's wearing this spun silver garment. The light hits him and the crowd says, the voice not of a man but a God. And he just eats it up and takes it in and then he collapses on the stage and he dies a few days later. That was in the year 44 AD. With his premature death, his son, who was the heir, Agrippa II, was only 17 years old, too young to take over the, the, the reign of power. And as a result, Roman governors were substituted for him. As Agrippa II got older, and when this is happening, he is somewhere around his early 30s, 31, 32, something like that. And uh, anyway, he is now coming into his own. He is considered a king, but he only rules in areas in northern Galilee, in what we today would call the Golan Heights region, and into Syria, and then down on the uh, eastern side of the, the Jordan River in what used to be called Perea, which we now call Jordan. Anyway, he is now King Agrippa II, now that he's old enough. And so he and his oldest sister, come to uh, meet the new Roman governor. Uh, they have a colorful past and a fascinating future. We know, for instance, that these two, Agrippa and Bernice, uh, their own sister had been married to the previous governor. Remember, we read about Felix being married to Drusilla, their younger sister, and how he had wooed her away from her king husband in, Sy in Emesa in Syria. Uh, not only that, but she had been married off by her brother when she was very young. She was only 14 when she was given away in marriage. But Bernice was actually married even earlier. Keep in mind, these folks are part of the Herod family. And the Herod family could make a soap opera to end all soap operas. She ended up, at the age of 13, being married to her uncle, her uncle Herod. <laughs> and uh, it was not a happy marriage. She couldn't wait to get out of it. And he died, and she was happy, and she moved in with her brother. And here was the gossip of the day, which appears to have been more than gossip. They were living in an incestuous relationship. And in fact, it became so widely known that she ended up marrying another individual, but didn't like him and left him and went back to her brother again. And so we have a colorful cast of characters here. Uh, we also know a little bit about their future because what we know from the, the historical record is that Bernice would later become the mistress of a Roman general by the name of Titus, the guy who 10 years later, 10 years after this, would destroy the city of Jerusalem and destroy the temple. So, you know, colorful cast, to put it mildly. And uh, now these two royal members of the royal household show up they meet with Festus, and uh, this is what Luke tells us. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Verse 14, since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, there's a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. 
I told them that it is not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before they have faced their accusers and have had an opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. And, and this gives us insight into Festus too. Festus is a hard-driving, hard-working guy, but he knows next to nothing about the Jewish religion and nothing about the faith of Jesus. And so all he is dealing with here is little bits and pieces of information, and he is just thoroughly flummoxed. What in the world is going on here? How come this guy was held for two years without trial? Uh, it, it, it seems to be nothing deserving death, and it all revolves around some dead guy named Jesus who Paul says is alive. Don't you love that? <laughs> and and, and it, it gives us real insight to what's going to follow. So Festus is explaining all of this to uh, Agrippa and Bernice, and he continues on. He says, um, verse 20, I was at a loss how to investigate such matters, so I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. But when Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I'd like to hear this man myself. Festus replied, tomorrow you will hear him. And uh, thus the stage is set for one of the most remarkable testimonies ever given. We have here now the words of Jesus being fulfilled once again. Jesus had told Paul, you will proclaim me before the Gentiles, before the religious establishment in Jerusalem, before kings, and before the emperor. And if you look at it, not only was Festus relieved, I believe, that Paul had appealed to Rome, but this enables what Jesus had said all along to take place. What if Festus had said, uh, charges are groundless, case dismissed? What would have happened? Paul would have been released and probably would have been killed by the very people who were trying to kill him in the first place. Instead, he remains in Roman custody. He will be taken by Roman soldiers directly to Rome, and he will meet with the emperor of the the entire Roman world face to face to make his case. And what we are receiving right now is going to be the case that Paul will make to Nero Caesar. He makes it first to Festus and to Agrippa and to Bernice. And he does it on the fly. It's not like, you know, he is told uh, next week, uh, you know, on, on such and such a time, you're going to be asked to meet before the, the, the king and, and others. Now, he's told, here's the day, you're on. And so it's at that point that we pick up verse 23. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city. They entered with great pomp. Uh, the Greek word that is used here is used only one time in the entire New Testament, and that's here. And the word is fantasia, from which we get the word fantasy. In other words, this is all make-believe. They're coming with great pomp. They're make, you know, everybody's wearing their, their robes. It, it says the, uh, the, the high-ranking military officers were there. The word that is used is the Greek word kiliarchos. And we know from Roman records that there were five kiliarchs or tribunes who were stationed in the city of Caesarea. They were in charge of a total of five cohorts of soldiers, each cohort being somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 to 1,000 men. 
So you, you've got a, a, you know, a huge group of, of Roman troops who are here in the city, and now here come the chief officers. And you can just picture them, can't you? Dressed up in their, their you know, dress uniforms with their red capes, uh, probably medals you know, hanging on, on every uh, open bit of, of fabric and material. You have the ruling people, the high members of the, the society in Caesarea. King Agrippa is there. Bernice is there and everybody's whispering behind their backs. Have you heard the story about those <laughs> two, you know? And, and here comes the new governor and Paul is brought in. And he is brought in in chains, we're going to see. What a difference. A man of faith, a man of deep devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ, who comes in with no pretenses. He comes in in chains, but he speaks the truth. And those who hear him, well, they're coming in with great fantasy, great pomp. I, I just, I have to pause here for a second because you realize the incredible irony of this. What started out as a movement following Jesus, the one who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, whose followers were known for being dedicated to him, gracious even to their enemies, turning the other cheek, being faithful even to the point of death. And what would ultimately happen years later is that the very pomp of the Romans would become the pomp of the church. And uh, it is tragic. It is real. We need to understand that, and we need to take that to heart personally. Because our Lord did not call us to put on airs or to, uh, to glorify ourselves. He called us to give him praise and glory, to love others, even our enemies, and to live upright, godly, devoted lives following his Holy Spirit as he leads and guides us. And I, I can't help as I read this, but think how easy it is to head off the rails. And uh, in fact, uh, talking with one of our, our class members before class began and talking about persecution. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I've read recently is that in all the literature that we have, there is not a single instance of a person who is described as a follower of Jesus committing any aggressive act against anyone else until after the time of Constantine. You know, these early believers were simple people who followed their Savior and yielded themselves to him. I mean, they, they still had all the failings that we do, but the church was the body of Christ not an institution. And when it became an institution, then in comes the pomp. So anyway, so much for that, but we can't ignore it. This is what, uh, what happens next. They all gather together, all these prominent men, and then we read, at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. This is one of those instances where we may actually know the very site where this takes place. Uh, as a result of excavations done in Caesarea over the last 30 years or so, uh, what has happened is we have unearthed the remains of Herod's palace where the Roman governor was stationed and had his headquarters. As that excavation was carried out, they also excavated what appears to be a public gathering room where large numbers of people could gather with a raised platform area and uh, you could have a, a huge public meeting. Here it is. To uh, kind of set the, the stage here, I'm just going to do a little drawing here. Uh, you are looking from south to north. And so what you see right up here that is the remains of the man-made harbor at Caesarea. This massive harbor built by King Herod the Great. The, uh, let's see, that would be the 
great-grandfather of Agrippa II, built by King Herod the Great the first use of hydraulic concrete, concrete poured into water, this massive harbor, a portion of which still can be seen below the surface of the waves. Uh, the Mediterranean is the sea that we're looking at here on the, at the top and on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, in addition, the uh, the aqueduct that I mentioned and we saw earlier, it'd be located right up, up there, beyond, beyond eye level here, beyond what we can see, but it's up there to the north. And what we have right here is the excavation of what appears to be a large gathering area where large groups of people could meet for public hearings. And today, many archaeologists and historians believe that's where the Apostle Paul went. In fact, relatively recently, uh, they actually put up a, a sign in both Hebrew and English, the very words that, that we, will, uh, we just read from Acts chapter 25, where the Apostle Paul says, for if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. And please note, written in uh, Hebrew on the right-hand side, in English on the left, and this appears to be the site where this all takes place. So here we go with one of the most amazing testimonies ever uttered by any believer to the most incredible audience gathered yet. Festus said, verse 24, Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man, the whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome, but I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. For I think it is unreasonable to send a prisoner on to Rome without specifying the charges against him. Then Agrippa said to Paul, and you see what's going on here. The Roman governor is speaking to the entire assembly and directs his remarks especially to King Agrippa. And after giving this introduction and explaining how he needs to have some information that he can send on to Emperor Nero, he says, King Agrippa, I turn the investigation over to you. And here we go. Then Agrippa, chapter 26, verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Keep in mind the Apostle Paul at this point is probably in his late 50s, maybe getting close to 60 years old. Agrippa is a young guy, early 30s. And he looks at the prisoner, whom as we will see in just a little bit, is chained. And he says, you have permission now to speak. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. Now let me ask you a question. Why is that even mentioned here? Paul motioned with his hand. I believe, can't prove it, I believe it's because Luke was there. And Luke saw this, and it was so dramatic as Paul motions with his hand that is attached to a chain. And now he gives his defense a prisoner in chains, to these exalted individuals who are in their, you know, their finest clothing. And here is a man in chains, but a man for whom the gospel will never be chained. And so Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently, 
Now keep in mind, as Paul talks about his defense against the accusations of the Jews, King Agrippa II is Jewish. And King Agrippa II does have an understanding of Jewish culture and practice, but he was raised in Rome. And uh, King Agrippa was a man who was known as a bit of a playboy. Uh, but now he has assumed the, the, the royal office. A as Josephus told us earlier, he often visited the city of Jerusalem. And while he was dining in the Hasmonean palace, he liked to look out on the temple and see what the priests were doing. And especially since he had the power to appoint a high priest. And the priests didn't care for that at all. And so they build a wall so he can't see them. Anyway, Paul now speaks about those Judean leaders. And uh, this is what he then says. I therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child. From the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. And he's hearkening back to the fact that he was born in Tarsus in what we today would call south, south uh, eastern Turkey. He was born in Tarsus, but he was raised and grew up in Jerusalem, where he studied under Gamaliel, one of the greatest Jewish rabbis and teachers of the day. Highly respected. He says, the Jewish people all know this, all the, know the way I lived ever since I was a child. Verse 5, they have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conformed to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise of our 12, our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? And so immediately, he is laying out his case. And the case is, I grew up in a strong Jewish family. I was raised here in Jerusalem. I was a, a devout Pharisee, and everyone knows that. And the reason I have been on trial is because I believe in what every devout Jewish man and woman believes, and that is the dead are going to be raised. Widely held among the Jewish people, except the Sadducees the high priestly establishment, the quote-unquote Jews who are making the accusations. Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. Sadducees are basically like the Romans. When you're dead, you're dead. And uh, Paul is saying, it's because I believe in the resurrection that this is going on. Now, put yourself for just a moment in the place of Festus. Festus has asked for Agrippa's help in knowing what should I write to Rome. And now Agrippa starts the, the proceedings. And Paul is speaking to Agrippa, but Festus is listening. And Festus is the guy who earlier had said this. Paul believes in some dead guy named Jesus whom he says is alive. And now Festus is learning that devout Jewish people believe the dead are going to be raised. And Paul says, why should any of you consider it incredible, unbelievable, that God raises the dead? And with that, he goes into his personal testimony. And again, I think it's very important for us to view this in light of who is listening. It's not just Agrippa and Bernice. It is also the Roman governor, Festus. Paul is invited to make his defense and instead, what he does is to make a gospel presentation. <laughs> he, 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 is, he is going to evangelize these people. And so this is what he says. And keep in mind, Festus is hearing this for the first time. And what he's hearing is this. Paul says, verse 9, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was, a possible, was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. 
and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. And now, what is Festus hearing? The very people who are trying to kill Paul were the people who enlisted him to hunt down believers in Jesus. And I'm guessing he is thinking, what in the world is going on here? He is, as best we can tell, a secular Roman who has no heart for the Jewish faith. And he is just trying to figure out what this all means. And Paul is laying out a case that speaks not only to the Jewish people, but to the Romans. And he's saying, listen, I used to be just like them. I used to oppose the believers in Jesus. In fact, they enlisted me to do that. And I hunted them down. And when I, brought, I captured them, I put them in prison. I actually voted for their execution. I went from synagogue to synagogue trying to root out these people. And on one occasion, with the authority of the high priest, I was headed to Damascus. And now we hear for the third time in the book of Acts the story of Paul's conversion. We saw it first in Acts chapter 9 as Luke relates what happened. We heard it again in Acts chapter 22 as Paul shared his testimony with the, the Jewish leaders and, and the rioters in Jerusalem. And now we hear it a third time. And what Paul is going to do is give his testimony in an incredibly powerful way that is especially attuned to the people who are listening. And we learn some things we have not heard before. In each instance, when the story of Paul's conversion is given, we learn a few extra details. And here, we learn a lot of them. And they are amazing. So, let's go on. Paul says, verse 12, On one of these journeys I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, and uh, your, your translation may well have a little footnote there. Uh, the, the word literally is Hebrew. And so the voice says in either Aramaic or Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? If, if Jesus was speaking Aramaic, it sounds something like this. This is, of course, with a Minnesota accent. <laughs> Shaul, Shaul, Ma'at Radafini. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? If he said it in Hebrew, then it sounds a little bit different. Shaul, Shaul, Lama Ze Tirdefeni. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? That's what he hears. And that's what Festus hears. This guy, called by the high priest, goes to Damascus, and about noon, all of a sudden, a light brighter than the sun and a voice from heaven. Um, you know what people think when somebody says, I heard a voice from heaven. And I'm guessing, I'm not even guessing, we'll hear in just a second what Festus thought. But... Paul is just laying it out there. This is what happened, guys. And uh, so he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. A goad, by the way, was a, a wooden stick with a metal point on it that was used to uh, herd oxen. And uh, what you would do is if the, the ox started moving in the wrong direction, you'd tap him upside the, the ear. And uh, if that didn't do it, you'd kind of poke him a little bit. And, and gradually the oxen got the idea, okay, I know where you want me to go. I'll go there even though I don't want to. And what Jesus is saying to Paul is, it hurts for you to kick against my directing you. I want you to head in a different direction. And uh, then I asked, verse 15, Paul says, then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. And 
That, of course, <laughs> sent a chill through this man and totally changed his life. We know from what we read in Acts chapter 9, he had a breakdown. Just absolutely did not eat or drink for three days. He was blinded by this incredibly bright light. But now we are given something we have not yet heard. And it includes one of the most powerful verses in all the Bible. Because this is the rest of what Jesus said. What we've read before, Jesus tells him, go to Damascus, you know, and I will tell you what to do and so on and so forth. But now, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now, get up and stand on your feet. And everything now from verses 16 to 18 is new material. We have not seen this before. So Paul is laying this out. He says, now, Jesus said, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. And that is very significant. What you have seen and what you will see. And as we have already learned, Jesus showed him an awful lot. Not just there on the road to Damascus, but over the next years. As he spent three years in Arabia, and then as the Lord appeared to him at Jerusalem. And, and <coughs> pardon me and would continue to reveal himself in powerful ways. So Jesus is telling him, I, you know, I want you to be a witness to what you have seen and will see. Then verse 17, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. And then we come to this amazing sentence. End of verse 17 and verse 18. Jesus says, I am sending you to them, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now think of that for just a second, what the Lord is saying here. This is such a powerful word from God. I am sending you to them. Who's them? Jews and Gentiles alike both the Jewish people and the non-Jewish world. I'm sending you to them to do what? To open their eyes. In other words, right now, they cannot see the truth. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes. Now imagine if you're Festus hearing this. And he is hearing this, a voice from heaven, this dead guy whom Paul says is alive, tells him, I'm sending you to them, Jews and Gentiles. And there are Jews and Gentiles gathered here in this room on the shore of the Mediterranean in the city of Caesarea. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. You know, the apostle John tells us, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. In other words, Jesus is saying, We're gonna I'm going to use you to turn them from the spiritual darkness to the light of the living God. And not just that, from the power of Satan to God. And do you realize what that means? It means that those who are opposing the Lord Jesus are following the bidding of the devil himself. And, and Paul realizes, you know, in this moment, in this instance, what he learns is everything I've been devoting my life to, not only has it been wrong, but I have actually been fighting against the very God I profess to serve. And Jesus says to him, now I'm sending you to open their eyes. Paul's blinded right now, but... He's going to be sent to open eyes, turn people from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God. Because what does the New Testament describe the devil as? The God of this world and the God of this age. And so he is going to be turning Jews and Gentiles, religious and irreligious, from the power of Satan to the power of God. Why? So that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified, set apart, made holy by faith in me. 
Uh, Jesus is giving the Apostle Paul the whole counsel of God. And Paul is laying that out now before this distinguished audience. Verse 19. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. In other words, after encountering the Lord Jesus Christ, risen in all of his glory, I did what he told me. <laughs> I, I didn't push back. It hurts to kick against the goats. And so I was obedient to that vision. And the implication is, no matter the cost. And that's why he's in chains right now. Because he was obedient to what the Lord told him. Well, first to those in Damascus, verse 20, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. Paul learned real quickly. He was a quick study. He's following the sermon outline of John the Baptist. John the Baptist came and said what? Repent because the kingdom of God is near. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Messiah is coming. What did Jesus say? Same sermon outline. Repent. The kingdom of God is near. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Believe the good news. What does Paul say? He preached to whom? To Jews and Gentiles alike, to religious people and irreligious people. Repent, believe, bear fruit. He is leading people from darkness to light, opening their eyes from the power of Satan to the power of God so that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and be numbered among those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus. Uh, he is just laying out the full counsel of God. And by the way, what he is saying here did not go over well, as we have already seen. Because how did the religious people respond to this? Many of them in Jerusalem we've already seen. They, they were livid with rage. Because why? They were still under the power of Satan. They may have been very religious. They may have known their Bibles. But the fact of the matter is they were living for themselves and they were not listening to the spirit of the living God. And when Messiah came, they sought to kill him because it went against everything that they thought. What we see in the life of Jesus is his own family said he was out of his mind. The religious leaders said he was demon-possessed. His own disciples ultimately abandoned him at the moment he needed them the most. But the fact of the matter is, he is the truth, and in him there is life. And he is controversial. He said, I did not come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. He is the prince of peace, but his message divides. And Paul is now saying, and that's the message that I proclaimed. Verse 21, that is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. And so what he has done is given a gospel presentation. And he anchors it all in the messianic predictions of the Hebrew prophets. He anchors it in the Torah and in the prophets. He tells this is the way it is and this is what happened to me. I went from being a persecutor to one who is persecuted. I went from being one who hated the name of Jesus of Nazareth to one who is willing to die for him because he is alive. And so putting ourselves back in the role of Festus, how do you think he received that? Well, we know. Verse 24. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. And what that tells us is Festus realizes this is just, this is not his culture. This is not what he, you know, he has bought into all of his life. And he says, you got to be crazy. He treats Paul the same way that Jesus was treated. You're nuts. You're out of your mind. He does admit your great learning is driving you insane. 
he realizes this is one smart fellow. You know, th this is this is no you know little hick guy from from Podunk who who doesn't know anything. This is a brilliant man. But he says, "You're out of your mind. You are out of your mind." What's Paul's response? I find it very fascinating. He doesn't yell back. Festus shouts, Paul, you're out of your mind. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. Note that, very gracious. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. And now he's speaking to a Roman. I am speaking truth. And what I'm saying is rational and reasonable. Remember Jesus before Pilate? Anyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And what's Pilate's reaction? What is truth? Paul says, I'm speaking it because I'm talking about the one who is the truth. And it is very reasonable. Verse 26, Paul goes on. The king is familiar with these things, and I can talk freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. And here again, he is speaking both to Jew and to Gentile. Admittedly, the Romans looked on, on Israel as kind of, uh, you know, one of the most difficult of the provinces to rule and, and uh, you know, a, a place that no one wanted to go. But... It was the crossroads of history. There is a reason God gave this land to the Jewish people. He put them at the crossroads of human history where three continents come together, Europe, Africa, and Asia. If you look at the history of the, the, the human race as it's been recorded, everything moves through that area throughout time. Today, where are the eyes of the world focused? So often, it's right there in the land that God promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and their seed forever. And, and Paul is saying, hey, the king is familiar with this. None of this happened in a corner. In other words, the evidence is out there. And the evidence was profound. Keep in mind, it was just a few years before this. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said that the Lord Jesus, I delivered to you what is of first importance, that Christ suffered according to the scriptures, died according to the scriptures, was raised according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter, then he appeared to the 12, then he appeared to 500 of the brothers, most of whom are still alive, but some have died. And then he appeared to me, last of all, as to one untimely born. Paul is saying the evidence is there. There are eyewitnesses who can testify to this. And not only that, it is completely in keeping with everything the Hebrew scriptures have said all along. It's what the prophets declared. It is what we have been hoping for for generation after generation. And he has arrived and he is the Messiah and he is God and he has risen from the grave. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. In other words, it's a rhetorical question. You believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. And the guy who started out by motioning with his hand now apparently raises his hands. And my desire for you is that you all become what I am, except for these chains. Mm -hmm. You can almost see him grinning as he says that, can't you? He is gracious. He, 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 he is very, very personal and direct. He tells his story in a compelling way. And... Uh, and it rankles and rattles. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice and those sitting with them. In other words, okay, this is over. <laughs> They've heard his testimony. He's, he's getting awfully close to the bone here, and that's enough. 
You know, do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? That's it. That's it. We're stopping now. The king rose and with him the governor and Bernice and those sitting with them. After they left the room, they began saying to one another, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And don't you wonder what they talked about for the rest of the afternoon and what they discussed in the days that follow. What would happen ultimately to these individuals? You know, someday we'll know. But they've heard the gospel message. And Paul has just had the opportunity to basically prepare to share the story with the emperor. And that's where we're going to pick up next week. Uh, we will... We'll pick up in chapter 27, same time, same place next week. We get into one of the most exciting and, and in fact, the most detailed uh, sailing journey recorded in all of ancient literature. And then we head to Rome. And we're going to see some incredible stuff. It, it, again, this story just keeps getting better and better. And what we're also going to see is that Paul will arrive there in Rome at a unique juncture in human history that will just blow your mind if you haven't heard it before. Uh, it's humorous, it's tragic, it's true, and it helps explain an awful lot that goes on in the last two chapters of this book. So on that note, we're going to close with prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, we bless and praise your holy name. We honor you. We glorify you because you truly are the living God. May your Holy Spirit come upon each of us in increasing measure, Lord. May we walk faithfully and boldly before you. May we, like Paul, yield everything for the supreme joy of knowing Jesus Christ, our Savior. To him be the praise. Amen.